Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are, and welcome to this webinar. My name is Simon Ritter. I'm the Deputy CTO at Azul. Before we get started, I've got a couple of housekeeping things just to let you know. First is that we are going to be recording this session and we will send you a link to the recording afterwards so that if you want to watch it again yourself or if you want to share it with your colleagues, your friends or even your family, then you're quite welcome to do so. We will also send you a copy of the slides so that you can review those later as well. If you have questions, then please enter those into the GoToWebinar control panel. There's a Q&A section there, and I will deal with those at the end of the session. Now, the idea of this webinar is to talk about the art of Java type patterns. And so we're going to talk about some of the newer features in the Java language, and also some of the ideas that are possible that may be included in future versions of Java as well, all around this idea of patterns. So first thing, pattern matching in Java. Now, don't get concerned, don't run away. I did actually have one person who left the presentation when I put this slide up this morning. So bear with me just for a few seconds. Um, there is a library in Java called java.util.regularexpression, and that has some library classes and methods available in it. So if we want to do pattern matching in Java, we can do it with a library and we can create a pattern. In this case, we can compile a particular regular expression, which is A followed by zero or more characters followed by B. Then we can create a matcher for that based on a particular string and we can call matches on that, which will return a Boolean. Great. And if we want to, we can do that with a single method call. That is not what we are here to talk about. We are going to be talking about pattern matching in the Java language. Now, the concept of pattern matching has been around for a long time. It's a well-known technique being used in many different programming languages. You can really trace it all the way back to the 1960s. If you look at languages like Haskell or even languages like Awk, if you've used that, then they use pattern matching as well. What do we mean by a pattern matching? Well, a pattern in this case consists of two distinct things. What we have is a match predicate. And what that gives us is a way of determining whether we have a target that matches a given pattern. So being a predicate, it evaluates to a Boolean. It's either true or false. We either match against the pattern that we're looking for or we don't. Then what we have associated with that match predicate is one or more pattern variables. And those pattern variables are then conditionally extracted based on the predicate. And if the pattern matches, variables will be extracted and made available to us to use in our code. There are a number of different pattern types that we can use. The first of those is the constant pattern type. And what we're doing there is essentially matching on a constant. So we have a predicate, we look for a constant. This has already been used in Java for, and if you look at the switch statement, you will find that you can do things like case one, case two. That's essentially a constant pattern matching. We're looking for the pattern, which is value, value one or value two. And then we can do something based on that. But of course, since we have a constant, we don't have a pattern variable because we know what the value is. We know it's one, we know it's two. Second pattern type that we have, and this is what we're going to start talking about in terms of new features in Java, is the idea of a type pattern, which is where we match on a type in the Java language. Java being object oriented has the idea of types represented by classes, which we instantiate to create objects. So we can look at the, the matching basically on the class that we're using. There are some other ones that we can talk about as well, and we'll get into these later on, where we have the idea of deconstruction pattern. Deconstruction pattern is where we match against a particular thing, but then we're also doing a further level of extraction rather than just binding the variable to the value that we're testing against, we can actually extract things from that. And we'll talk about that specifically around the idea of records and so on. Then we have the idea of a, a var pattern, which is essentially where we're, we're using type inference in the same way that we have in JDK 10, we've got type local variable type inference. We could potentially use that in patterns as well. And again, I'll kind of talk back about that towards the end with the idea that where 
we have a value that we're, a parameter, a binding variable that we want to use, but we're not concerned with us having to remember what type it is, and we'll let the compiler figure that out for us. And then the last one we're going to talk about in this session is the idea of an any pattern type. And we use, could use an underscore for that. Essentially, that's similar to the idea of var in that we match against anything, but actually what we do is bind to nothing. Um, this is similar to some of the ideas that came up in JEP 302. But once again, we will talk about some examples of that later on. There is one other pattern type called method patterns, but because we don't have any examples of that in this presentation, I'm not going to talk about that specifically. Right, now, first thing, before we get into the actual details of pattern matching, we need to kind of revise and review some of the new features that have been added to Java more recently because of how pattern matching applies to them specifically. First of those is the idea of switch expressions. Right from the very beginning, Java has had the concept of a switch statement. It was brought over from the C programming language syntax, with the idea that if you were migrating from C to Java, it would be a familiar feel in terms of the syntax, so easy to make that migration. That's very good, but of course, the switch statement in the C programming language, the language that's used for systems programming, is not really ideal in some ways for the kind of applications that we write in Java. And the reason I say that is that it's a little bit more error prone than we really want it to be. One of the reasons that it's error prone is that for each set of cases that we have, we have a block of code that we execute if we match on a case, and we must remember to put a break statement in there. Otherwise, perfectly legitimately, we will fall through into the next case block or default. That is problematic because we forget to do that. We can end up with hard to find bugs because it's not a compile time error, it's a runtime error. And I'm sure if I could see the audience and actually ask you to raise your hands, I'm pretty sure that most people, if not all, would own up to the fact that at some point when you've written a set of case statements, you've forgotten to put a break statement in. I know I've certainly done that more than once. So putting the break statement in is also is, is one of those things that can be a little bit error prone. Another thing is that we have to separate every case statement and also the scope of local variables is sometimes not quite as intuitive as it could be. Now, if we look at an example of how we would use switch statement, this is a very common idiom for how we use that, which is that we're switching on one variable, in this case, day, and we want to assign a value to another variable, in this case, number of letters. So we have our switch on day, and then we have case Monday, case Friday, case Sunday, assign number of letters to be six. Then we put in our break, and we have to remember to do that. There are two things here. One is we have to remember to the break in, but we also have to remember to assign a value to number of letters. If we don't do that, because we've got an instance variable that we're using, which will be pre-assigned with value, then we don't have any way of catching that with the compiler. So we could end up with zero rather than the number that we want. So as I say, this is problematic from the point of view of how it works and the potential for error. In JDK 12, we got the idea of a switch expression. Now, in terms of the expression, rather than being just a statement which executes a set of commands, we can evaluate something and return a result. By doing that, it simplifies our code a lot. We can see here we've got far fewer lines of code. One of the reasons for that is that we only make one assignment to number of letters the result of the switch expression. That's great because we only do it once and it's easy to make sure that we've done that correctly. Within the switch expression, we now have a slightly modified syntax. One wonderful thing here is the fact that we now can use a comma separated list. Can't believe it's taken us 25 years to figure that out. But now we can say case Monday, comma Friday, comma Sunday. We then borrowed some of the syntax from Lambda expressions, the arrow operator, and the right-hand side of the arrow operator is the value that we're going to return from the switch expression, or in the case of the default, a throwing an exception. This is good because the compiler can make sure that for every case that we have, we do return a value or we throw an exception. That way, there's no chance to forget to return a value and not have the number of letters assigned the value that we actually wanted to. So we can see here that we've got 
shorter, more concise code, but we haven't lost any of the readability. We can still see exactly what's going on. This is all very good. Now, the other thing about switch expressions is that they must be complete. They must be exhaustive in terms of the values that we are switching on. In this case, we have day and it's enumeration, which has values Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we have to have all of those represented in the switch expression. We'll come back to why this is important a little bit later on. The other thing we need to talk about in terms of newer features in Java is algebraic data types. Now, in Java, we obviously have the concept, as I said, of classes. It's object-oriented language, we encapsulate things, and we do that very often. In a case like this, where all I'm doing is encapsulating some data, not really any behavior, what I end up with is a class called point. It's going to store two values, double X and double Y. To do that, I create a new class. Then I have to declare the instance variables as being final and double. I need a constructor, which I pass parameters to, which are the values X and Y that I want to create for that particular point. I have to explicitly assign those to the instance variables. Then in order to access the values of that, because they're private, I need an accessor method which returns a double, returning X and returning Y. 14 lines of code simply to do a tuple. Now I have long thought that we should have a tuple class in Java. I did talk to Brian Gertz about this, but he said, well, yes, I, you know, we could give you a tuple class, but then you'd want a triple class, then you want a quadruple class, and where would we stop? So in JDK 14, we got a much better way of doing that, which is records. And what a record represents is essentially a data class. Here, I've declared a record called point, and I use the same syntactic style as the constructor to declare the values that I want to store in my record. So point, double X, double Y. This is great because now, rather than having 14 lines of code, I have one line of code. A, a record is still a form of class, so it has a body, and we represent that with the braces, but because there's nothing in that that we want to do differently, we simply leave empty braces. The compiler will fill in all the details for us. It will effectively de-sugar that into the same code that we saw on the previous slide. Because records are just a type of class, we can make them generic. So if we wanted to, we could declare a record with a generic type parameter, and we could use that type parameter to tell the compiler what it is we actually want to store in that record being generic. We can make our record a little bit more sophisticated. We can add more functionality to it and do something like this. We can declare a record called circle. In this case, it has one value that it's going to store, a radius. And what I can do is I can add static instance fields. I can't add any other instance fields such as you know a different value that would vary. Only the ones that are declared in the record definition are allowed. But if I want a static variable, then I can do that. I can introduce pi 3.142 and use that within my record. I can also add my own methods. I've declared one here, which returns the area as pi times r squared. So we have the ability to do different things with that if we want to. A couple of extra things to be aware of with records. The first is that the base class of all records is java.lang.record, which means that you can't have a record which inherits from another class. You can obviously implement interfaces if you want to, no problem with that. You can provide the implementation of the necessary methods. And the other thing to be aware of is that records are implicitly final. You cannot extend a record any further. And if you wanted to, you could put the final modifier on there, but it's not actually necessary. The only other thing to be aware of with records, um, there are some other things to know about, but this is the thing that we need to know about here, is that it doesn't follow the Java Bean pattern in terms of the accessor methods. If you were using the Java, Java Bean pattern for the variable, you have a get followed by the variable name. And Conversely, if you have a, a variable that can be changed, then you have set as well. But for a record, rather than using get x or get y, the decision was made just to use the name of the variable. So we end up with a method called x and a method called y. Um, 
This can cause problems if you want to use records in a place where you're expecting the, the bean pattern. There is a way around this. It's uh, you know it's a little bit cheeky, but uh, if you really want to, you can actually call your variables get x and get y. That way, when the compiler generates the accessor methods, because the variable is called get x, the method will be called get x and get y and so on. So if you must, um, not really to be recommended, but it is a way around if you really have to do that. The other thing that we need to know about is uh, to do with Java inheritance. Once again, object-oriented language, so inheritance is a fundamental part of that. What I've got here, simple example, where I've got a shape class which has three subclasses, triangle, square, and pentagon. Now, the, the issue that we have is that from the point of view of the shape class, we have no real control over who can subclass from shape. The only thing that we can do as a developer is to mark it as final, which means that nobody can subclass shape. But in terms of our type hierarchy, we, if we don't make it final, anybody can subclass it in any way that they want it. And that might not be what we want. So what we got in JDK 15 was the idea of sealed classes. Actually, maybe in JDK 14 that this was introduced in. Um, but anyway, we got sealed classes. And what we do here is we use a new modifier on the class definition and we say public sealed class shape and then we add a permits clause which specifies the list of classes which can subclass shape in this case triangle square and pentagon if somebody comes along and says oh i really like your shape class i want to subclass that and make my new circle from that the compiler will look at the permits clause and say hmm circle is not listed in the permits clause, therefore this is not allowed and it will reject it with a compiler error. Now, one thing that you need to be aware of with sealed classes is that all of the subclasses of a sealed class must explicitly specify their inheritance capabilities. And there are three ways of doing that. The first is that we can continue to have a sealed class and specify further subclasses of that within that type hierarchy. Again, here I've got my triangle, so I say public sealed class triangle permits equilateral and isosceles and extend shape. The second thing that we could do is we could prevent any further subclassing. And um, we would use the standard way of doing that. We would mark it as final and therefore nobody can extend square any further. And then the third thing we can do uses another new modifier which in this case is a non-hyphen sealed modifier. It's our first hyphenated keyword in Java. And what that says is that now this class is no longer sealed, meaning that anybody can inherit from it. So Pentagon, if we wanted to, anybody could then go and head and, and subclass Pentagon. Right, so now let's talk about pattern matching in Java. And I've divided this into two sections. First section, we're going to talk about what's available in Java right now, so up to JDK 18. And then the second section, we're going to talk about what is going to be in, well, certainly in JDK 19, there's some changes, but then also some ideas for what might happen in terms of pattern matching further in the future with Java. So the first thing to look at is how we currently use the instance of operator. Because Java is object oriented, we have, as another aspect of that, polymorphism. We can view an object as any of the types that it actually is. So that means the direct type that it is plus any of the superclasses of that, plus any of the interfaces. And often we are faced with a situation where we're provided with a specific type, but that could then be other types as well. So it could be subclasses of the, the type that we give it. To determine exactly what type we have or a particular type, we use the instance of operator. Here's a very simple example. We say if obj instance of string, great. When we do that, within the body of the if statement where we've got the true value, in order to use obj as a string, we need to have this line here. So what we do is we must always perform an explicit cast with an assignment. We create a new variable s of type string. We assign that to the value of obj and put in a cast 
to let the compiler know that obj is a string, which is kind of redundant because you know the compiler already knows this because if you look at the line above, we've tested to see if it's an instance of string. It's positive, it's tested true, so it must be a string. Why do we really need to do this? But this is the way that it works. In JDK 14, we had the introduction of pattern matching for instance of. So now we're doing some type pattern matching. In this case, the, the predicate that we're using is obj instance of string. We are testing to see if obj is in fact of type string. The pattern variables that we have in this case is simply s. So we add a new variable and if obj is an instance of string, then s is assigned the value of obj. This means that the compiler is essentially filling in that extra line for us. We no longer have to do the explicit cast with assignment. The compiler does it for us. Now, if we look at the way that works in terms of the scoping of s, we can see that in terms of the true branch of this if statement, we know that we have a string objects a string, so s is valid, we can call s.length on it and everything will work. In the false branch of the if statement, clearly we don't have a string, so we haven't matched, therefore we haven't made s into a string, and so the scope of s doesn't work. We can be a little bit more sophisticated and we can add another test. We could do something like this. We could say if obj instance of string s and s.length is greater than zero. This will work because we know that the way that the AND operator is interpreted means that we always evaluate the left-hand side of the operator, and only if that evaluates to true do we evaluate the right-hand side. So if the left-hand side evaluates to true, we know we have a string, S is valid, and therefore we can use it on the right-hand side. We can test the length and see if it's greater than zero. However, if we were to try that with the OR operator, this wouldn't work. Because again, we know that we always evaluate the left-hand side of the OR operator, and only if that evaluates to false do we evaluate the right-hand side. So if it did evaluate to false, we don't have a string, therefore the scoping of S is not valid, we couldn't call S.length on it, and the compiler would recognize that straight away and give us a compiler error. We sometimes have to think quite carefully about where the scoping of the pattern variables is valid. So we could do something like this. We could have a method called do something which takes an object O. First thing we do is we test to see if O is an instance of string S, but we invert the test to say if it's not an instance of string, then we return from the method. What this means is that effectively the false branch of that means that S is valid. So we can use S in the rest of the body of that method. And there could be several hundred lines of code in there, but S will always be valid until we return from the method in this case. Which leads us to the idea of the, the way that binding variables have scoping. Now, if you look at the way that local variables have scoping, we know that wherever you declare a local variable, then the scope of that variable is valid until the end of the block of code in which it is declared. So if it's in a you know, set of parentheses, it's up until you end that set of parentheses. If it's in a method, it's up until you return from the method. If it's in a for loop and so on. The other thing is that locals are subject, subject to definite assignment. You have to make sure that something is assigned to a local variable Otherwise, the compiler will complain. It will say, you may not have assigned a value to this variable, and it won't compile. So you must make sure something is assigned to that. If we look at binding variables, they are also subject to definite assignment, meaning that a value must be assigned to them for them to be used. Great, makes sense. However, the scope of a binding variable is the set of places in the program where it would be definitely assigned. So this is the idea of flow scoping is that it's valid where or the scoping it applies where it actually has a value associated with it. However, the scope is not the same as local variables. As an example of that, if we do something like this, if O instance of integer num, then do something, and then we can have an else if O instance of float, and you also use num, and similarly else if O instance of long, and use num. 
Now, if we were using the same scoping as we did with local variables, we wouldn't be able to reuse num in those three different places. So we have to have flow scoping to be able to do that. It's only where num is valid uh, as assigned that it can actually be used. So if if we match against an integer, the place where num is is can be used is within that if statement. If it matches against a float, then num can be used within that part of the if statement. And again, if it's a long, num can be used within that part of the if statement. So that means that we, we have flow scoping that makes it easier for us to reuse variable names in this way. Otherwise, we'd have to have different variable names and that gets a bit messy. Here's an interesting little puzzle. So my question to you as an audience, and sadly, again, I, I can't have a show of hands on this one, will this work so i create an object called s and i assign to that a new instance of object great and then i've got a piece of code here which is if s instance of string and then we'll use s as the pattern variable and then if it is we'll print out string of length and call s dot length otherwise we'll print out no string so if you look at that you think to yourself well would it work or would it not work? And the answer is both. And you think, hang on, how can quantum superposition apply to compiled code? It either compiles or it doesn't compile. There's no way that that can both compile and not compile. Well, yes and no. So if you type that into your IDE or create a file and try and compile it with Java C, it won't compile. Then the compiler will quite rightly say to you, hang on, you've already used S for your object, you can't use s as your pattern variable because it won't work. However, if you use jshell and you type that in, and I've actually, as you can see on the screen here, I've actually done exactly that and printed it out onto the slide, it will work, which seems completely counterintuitive to me. I thought that jshell actually used Java C underneath, but how this works, I have no idea. Um, I think Remy Forex, who is one of the people who works on Project Amber, he was in the audience when I gave this presentation at DevOx France, and he seemed to think this was a bug. I, I tend to agree with him, but it is interesting that it actually works in JShell, but not in Java C. Anyway, moving on. So pattern matching for switch. Now, again, if we go back to what we were talking about earlier with the idea of switch statements and switch expressions, with a switch statement or a switch expression, the things that you can switch on are fairly limited. You can switch on integral values, numbers, you can switch on strings, and you can switch on enumerations. And in fact, those two things are kind of more modern. What they've done now is to expand the types that you can use with switch into type patterns. Here's an example. So now I've got a method called type tester that takes an object O and I can switch on O. And now the cases that I can have will have pattern uh, type patterns associated with them. First one is for null because we might want to be able to check that. Then I've got the idea of a string, a color and so on. Now, the first thing is that um, in the case of null, there isn't a pattern variable because doesn't really make any sense, does it? Because a null is a null is a null. So it's a, it's a constant. So there's nothing to bind it to. So we can say, yeah, that's a null type. Then we've got the idea of case of string. There is a pattern variable there, s. And if we want to use s on the right-hand side of the arrow operator, we can. So we can say what the string is. Similarly, for color, we can call methods on that because c is valid in that context. Now, Java has primitives. Primitives are not types in the true sense in Java, but an array of ints is. In that case, we can have a case for int array, and we can have a pattern variable IA, and then we can print out on the right-hand side the length of the array. And of course, we can also have a default if we want to, just to print out what the thing is if it's not any of the above. Now, there are a few things to say about the use of null in switches and pattern matching because null is special and a little bit more complicated so the, the first thing is this introduction of the idea of case null what we've done is is have that introduced for the idea of switch expressions but also switch statements so you can now add a case null into a switch statement and if you don't include that then 
we need backwards compatibility. So we need the behavior of the switch statement or the switch expression to work in exactly the same way as it would do before, which is to throw a null pointer exception if we try and, and use it. What we will see then is if we take this piece of code where we've got our type tester method and we have switch on O, then we have case string, case color, case int array and default. What the compiler will actually do is it will insert for us an extra case at the beginning. So we'll have a case null and that will by definition throw a null pointer exception. This means that we get the same behavior that we had before prior to the introduction of type patterns in switch. Now, what we could do is we might want to have null handled in the same way that we do default. So we can do that. What we can do is we can actually add null so that we can say null comma default. So either a null or something that's not covered by all the other cases, and then we'll print out bad input. So that avoids having the null pointer exception. So that's kind of an interesting thing and a useful thing so that we have the maximum flexibility in terms of how we can use a null within a switch. And it also avoids the problem of having to have an extra test before we get to the switch. So what we would typically have done before is to have, you know, uh, type tester of object O. If O is null, then you know, return or, or do something with it, then switch on O and do something with the different types. But now we can include that in, tidies things up, simplifies code. Completeness. Now I mentioned this when we talked about switch expressions and how they had to be complete and exhaustive in terms of the values that you have in the switch. We had enumeration, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we had cases for all of those. And we have to do that for all of our switches. Now what we can do is we can say, in this case, type tester, object O, switch on O, case string, case integer. The question there is, well, what happens if I pass in a float object? You could argue that because it's not covered by a case in the switch, that we simply ignore it and drop past the switch and then return, which would be a valid thing to do. But the decision was made that is going to lead to potential problems in terms of you know forgetting to do things and having bugs. So what the developer said is that we must handle all possible values in a switch. To do that, very logically, what we can do is simply introduce a default because that will cover anything which is not covered by the cases above. That means that we don't have to worry about trying to figure out all the possible types there and not being able to cover all the possible types. So this is kind of like the wildcard thing. Great. So now we have a complete exhaustive switch in our code. But what we don't have to do is in all cases have a default. If we go back to our sealed class example earlier on, sealed class means that we know exactly what type hierarchy is being declared. We know that we have a shape and then th only three subclasses of that, triangle, square, and pentagon. Because that was specified in the permits clause, there is no way that we could have anything else that inherits from shape. That way, if I defer define my switch like this, I switch on shape, having passed one into type tester, then I can have a case for triangle, a case for square, a case for pentagon, and a case for shape. That covers all possible types that could be a shape. That means that we now have completeness and the compiler will be quite happy with that. Another thing we can do is the idea of a guarded pattern. And this again comes back to what I talked about when we were talking about pattern matching with instance of and the ability to use the AND operator and then do a test based on the thing that we were matching against. We can do that within the switch. So now we can say, okay, shape tester, we'll pass in a shape, we'll switch on shape, and now we're going to have case triangle T, but then we also want to see if the area of the triangle is greater than 25. If it is, then we'll print out it's a big triangle. So we use the same idea, we have triangle T as our pattern, and the pattern variable is going to be T, then we'll use the AND operator and we'll evaluate T dot area against greater than 25. 
in order to be complete, we also need to have a case for triangle on its own, because it could be that the area is not greater than 25, in which case, if we didn't match on that first case and we had a triangle, we would not uh, deal with all possible eventualities. So we have another case below that, which is just for a triangle. And then we can say, well, that's a small triangle. So code is the same beyond that square, pentagon and shape. The idea of a guarded pattern then is you have your primary pattern, the AND operator, and a conditional AND expression. In JDK 19, they've decided to change that. Rather than using the AND operator, they're going to introduce a contextual keyword, and we're going to have case triangle T when T dot area is greater than 25. Well, I guess it makes it a little bit more readable, but uh, I think for most people that they would understand the AND anyway. But you know that's what they've decided, so that's all good. So now the syntax of that is primary pattern when conditional and expression. Pattern dominance is also very important. So the key thing here is that the less specific cases must not hide more specific cases. If I change the order of the cases in my type tester with shapes, and I do it this way around, so I put shape first, then triangle, then square, then pentagon. Well, obviously, a triangle, a square, and a pentagon are all instances of shape. And because we have polymorphism, we would match against shape first. And that's not going to work because, of course, we'll always match against shape. We would never, ever be able to get to triangle, square, or pentagon. So that code becomes unreachable, and the compiler will reject it. We also need to be careful when we're using guarded patterns, because that can also lead to something where we're hiding more specific things. If we switch the two that we had earlier, we switch the case of triangle T with the triangle with a guarded pattern, then again, we'll always match against triangle T first if we have a triangle, and that would hide the code in the guard. So we're never going to execute it, therefore it's unreachable doesn't make any sense. Compiler will reject that. We need to be a little bit careful though, because we could end up with a situation like that. You might think, well, okay, we'll just keep all the guarded patterns above the unguarded patterns. But if I do this, it's still not going to work. Because if I say case triangle T when true, now I've used true because that's easiest to demonstrate, but we could have a situation where something evaluates and it's always going to be true. Then Obviously, that will always result in the pattern match with the guard when we've got a triangle, regardless of because we're, we're matching against true. True is always true. So we would always print out definitely a triangle and we would never get to triangle T. So again, we'd have a dominated pattern with triangle T. So just be a little bit careful when you think about that. The compiler will help you and the ID will obviously point it out for you when we catch up with this, but um, just be aware of that. So technically it is a compile time error for a label in a switch block to be dominated by an earlier label in that switch block. That's basically from the specification. Pat matching in future Java, what things might we see coming up? Well. Definitely, we're going to see pattern matching instance of them records. Um, so what can we do now? Right, well, we can have a record port called point. We saw that earlier. That's all good. And what we could do is we could do something like this. We could say public void Pythagoras takes an object. If O is an instance of point, um, then, OK, this is probably not a very good example now, I'll look at it, but anyway, uh, you can see that we've got a point, and what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, that's a point on the hypotenuse somewhere, and what we want to do is calculate that, but to do that, we have to call the methods on point P, which is our pattern variable, but we explicitly have to say, right, X is extracted from P dot X, Y is extracted by P dot Y, and so on, and then we can calculate the uh, hypotenuse from that we could do better. So what we can do is pattern matching for records. This is going to be in JDK 19. What we can do is use a record pattern, and this is a deconstruction pattern that I mentioned earlier on. Because a record is a special form of class, this will also work with normal classes as well. So even though it's called pattern matching for records, it, it actually technically works with other classes. So what we can do here is we can say, right, Pythagoras method, 
if O instance of point, but then we provide the definition of point as our pattern variable. So point double X, double Y. That way, within the body of that if statement in the true branch, we can then use the values of X and Y because the pattern will actually extract the uh, deconstruct the record to give us the values of x and y that we can use within the the code that we write so now we just do x times x y times y we can have composability in patterns now if i make this code a little bit more sophisticated a little bit more complex let's take our point double x double y and introduce an enumeration we'll have color red green blue then we'll create another record called color point, which will have a point and a color. We'll then create a color rectangle, which has two records, a color point top left and a color point top bottom right. And to make our life easier, we'll also say that this implements shape. Now, I know shape was a class before, but bear with me and just think of it as an interface in this case so that we can have a type associated with that, which is shape. So then what I can do is I can have print color and pass in a shape. This is why I need to implement the interface so that we can have different things that could implement shape. And then we say if S instance of color rectangle, we'll decompose that because we know that we have a color point top left and a color point bottom right. And that way, if we want to print out the color of the top left, we print out top left dot C. All good. So that part what we do, but of course, we know that top left is a record as well. So let's compose that. And now we can say, if S instance of color rectangle, put the, the uh, record into that as color point, point P color C, and also the bottom right color is color point as well. And then in this case, we can print out C, which is the color. So we're dereferencing, deconstructing, everything works very nicely. But of course, point is yet another record. So we could compose that further. And if we wanted to, we could say print top left X of a shape. Again, we say if S instance of color rectangle, then we've got the record color point. We know that that has a point in it. So we can decompose that into X and Y. Then we can have color C, we can have color point BR. And then if we want to, we can print out the top left X coordinate as X. These are very simplistic examples, obviously, uh, for more complex ones that, that this would be more valuable, but at least this gives you an idea of what's actually going on. So what about patterns and local variable type inference? So this is not something that is in uh, JDK 19. So this is looking further ahead at the moment. Uh, I know no idea when this will make it into uh, Java, but essentially we can use the same idea of var which was introduced in JDK 10, local variable type inference. And we can use that to have any pattern being matched. This is nice because what we can do is not having to remember all of the types involved and actually having to type them in in our code. Previous example, we can say print top left X shape. OK, so is, if S is an instance of color rectangle and we've got color point, point, var X, var Y, and then we can also have var C, var BR, and then just print out X. We could potentially even take that one step further. We could use the any pattern. Now, this is one where I said this is completely um, hypothesizing what might happen. There's, I haven't seen anything in any JEP to indicate that this is going to happen yet. But this is the same idea as we saw with JEP 302, which still hasn't been implemented. And that's the idea of Lambda leftovers. Back in JDK 9, if you remember, the single underscore, which used to be valid as a variable name, and I'm sure nobody's ever used it as a variable name. Um, it used to be valid as a variable name, but from JDK 9 onwards, it wasn't. And that's because they made it into essentially a reserved word. The idea behind that was for Lambda expressions. If you had a variable in your Lambda expression that you didn't use in the body of the Lambda expression, you could effectively ignore it by putting an underscore in there. The same thing could be applied to our record patterns, and we could do something like this. So we could say, S, if S instance of color rectangle, the thing that we are interested in is color point, the thing that we're interested within that is point, 
we're interested in X within that, but we can use var. But then the other things we don't care about. So let's simply replace them with underscores. It means that we can just ignore them. But the compiler knows that there should be something there, so it can match to make sure that we have the right number of parameters and the right number of things in there. But we're essentially saying we don't care about them, so just ignore them. It does make things a little bit more readable, I think. So hopefully they will actually put this in at some point. Last thing to talk about is pattern matching for arrays. So why not decompose patterns for arrays? Now we could do something like this. We could have a thing that a method that prints the first two strings, pass in an object O, and we test to see if it's an instance of a string array. And we also test to see if the length of that array is greater than or equal to two. If it is, we extract the first element from the array as a string, extract the second element as the array as a string and print out the concatenation of the two strings. Why not simply do that with decompose pattern? So the idea would be that we could say if O instance of string array, then we declare the values of that as being string S1, string S2, and we'll use the variety operator, the, the triple dots, the ellipsis, to indicate that there could be more than two strings, but we don't care about them. So we, we're only interested in the first two, and then we can decompose those, have those values extracted, and have S1 plus S2. Now that was going to be in JET 405, but for some reason they seem to have dropped it for now. Um, I expect that it probably will come in later, but um, like I say, that, that has been dropped as a, something that will be in JDK 19, so it won't be in JDK 19. To summarize then, basically, so conclusions, pattern matching is a very powerful set of language constructs, and it's going to do a lot in terms of simplifying certain tasks that we do very regularly in Java. So less boilerplate code makes things a lot more declarative in terms of how we look at things and the simplicity of the code that we're dealing with. It actually has potential for better optimization of code underneath. Um, we haven't explored that at all in the in the presentation, haven't had time to do that, but there are some ideas for how using this kind of thing, we could optimize things in a better way from a, a compilation perspective. Obviously, some of these features are already included. They've been gradually adding things like pattern matching for instance of, um, pattern matching for switch and so on, and we'll see more things coming later, JDK 19, pattern matching for records and so on, and there are probably more things after that as well. And because I work for Azul, I will just use my one marketing slide to promote the fact that we provide builds of OpenJDK. They're called Zulu. We provide fully TCK tested builds and we have free builds that you can download from our website, JDK 7, 8, 11, 13, 15, 17, and 18. And we've even got early access version 19 as well. So I believe that we provide support for more versions of Java than anybody else in the industry. We even have JDK 6 still available, but that's for commercial customers only. In terms of platform support, usual 64-bit versions, Intel, Windows, Mac, and Linux. If you're determined to continue using Windows XP, we can also provide you a 32-bit version for Windows and Linux. Uh, there is a free community edition, and if you want commercial support, we also have Azul Platform Core. So with that, that is the end of the presentation. Um, just to reiterate what I said at the beginning, we will send everybody a copy of the slides. We will also send you a link to the recording. So if you want to watch it again or share it, then please feel free to do so. So let me see if I can go to questions. Um, so, if, so if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to type those into the Q&A box. Uh, yeah, so question is, will the will we also share the presentation material at the end? Yes, I will. Uh, okay, good. Um, okay, not seeing any other questions at the moment. Obviously, my description was flawless. Uh, at least I can convince myself of that. Um, so yeah, if anybody does have any questions, I'll just hang around for a few more seconds to see if anybody does have anything, the burning issues that they would like me to address. Um, I'm not seeing anything. So otherwise, um, yeah. Oh, oh, no, hang on. Uh, okay, uh, that's just a, uh, <laughs> a uh, thank you for that. Um, okay, so with that, then um, I will be doing other webinars in the future. So keep an eye on the Azul website. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>